Welcome to the second lecture on gut embryology. Today we'll be talking about the mid-gut. So the take-home points of what I want you to know today, in terms of the mid-gut, where does it start? Where does it end? This is particularly important for the adult anatomy of the gut. We want to know what the arterial supply of this part of the gut is. We want to see the main things that occur in the embryology of the mid-gut. So this is going to be um, how does the gut rotate and how does it herniate. And then we'll do a couple at the end, a couple of um, clinical correlates. So that's essentially what I want you to take from this small, short lecture. So let's start with, with the images that you can see on the board. Firstly, with this one, this is a mid-sagittal cut. And so what we've got in blue, we've got the, basically that's going to be the developing central nervous system. So the head's here and the tail's here, and this is on the outer border. Now in orange, we've got essentially the gut. So this, all this segment here is the gut, developing gut. At the front end, we've got the full gut, which we covered last lecture, and the back end down here is going to be the hind gut. So what we're going to be focused on today is this section here which is going to be the mid-gut. Behind that is in all in red, so basically all the stuff in the front is going to be the developing heart, and at the back, and in the red is going to be all mesodermal structures, and at the back is going to be more the dorsal mesentery, at least for the context of today. So that's how it looks at about uh, four to five weeks, and this is the starting point of today's lecture of the mid-gut. But before we jump into the major things that occur, I just want you to get your head around how it comes about from essentially the plate and the yolk sac into what we're going to be doing in the mid-gut. So when, when we've got the trilaminal disc, at, so at, at three weeks, the, the base of the disc is going to be endodermal. Um, when you, also with this huge sac that comes out at the, the base of the embryo, and this is the yolk sac. Now what happens is this yolk sac kind of starts to get incorporated within the gut tube, mostly or at least um, significantly due to the embryo folding in a craniocornal fashion. And so as it folds up, the yolk sac starts to get sucked in. And so what we see is two blind pouches. So you can see a blind pouch in here, and that's going to be the gut tube of the foregut, which we've already covered, and the latter end, which is going to be the hindgut. So all this stuff in the middle is the midgut, and that's what we're essentially going to be covering now. This slightly further developed, so this is now going to about the fifth, sixth week, so this is the important part for the midgut. What we can see is all the foregut, we have a herniation coming off here, so that's going to be the, for the lung bud, and then we've got another herniation out here, which is the liver bud. And so that's really the starting point for the midgut, is going to be the liver bud. And so where that comes out is the end of the foregut and the start of the midgut, all the way through to kind of this point, which is now going to be all hindgut. And so what that leaves us with is a slightly decreasing amount of yolk sac, um, two, two kind of intestinal limbs, which is going to be one here and one here, and it kind of loops around like that, and it has this developing communication, which is a vitiline duct, vitiline duct. And that's the communication between those intestinal loops and the yolk sac. So that's just a quick overview to show you how the yolk sac changes and how it incorporates into the gut tube and how the mid-gut kind of communicates, stays communicating with the yolk sac compared to the other full gut and high gut, which become these blind pouches. Now, if you were to jump down to this image, this image is really just to indicate the blood supply. So the, the blood supply to the mid-gut is the superior mesenteric artery, which is a trunk a main trunk of the abdominal aorta. Unlike the foregut, which is the celiac artery, this is going to be um, the superior mesenteric artery. But what you can see, and I'll come back to this image, is that you've got these two loops. One loop, one loop. And that's what I was indicating here. With a connection, which is this, and that's the vitiline duct, 
vitaline duct, which is going out to the yolk sac. Okay, so that's just giving you a very brief indication of how we have these two primary intestinal loops, one on top, one below, and that's important for the two parts of the midgut. So the foregut will end there. Okay, so foregut ends at this point, so that means the midgut starts and the hindgut begins there. So that's the end of the midgut. So all of this is midgut with two loops, a cranial loop and a caudal loop with a connection almost in the middle with a vitelline duct. All of this is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. So all these branches are important for the adult, which we'll come to in this image a bit later. So everything from this upwards is going to be celiac. Everything down is going to be inferior mesenteric artery and all of the midgut is superior mesenteric artery. So it's a very important it's a take home message, which is the blood supply to it. Now, this is going to be around the six weeks. So what we need to do to develop the midgut, we, we actually have to come out of the body. Now, this is the starting point with this image. So what I've done with the intestinal loops, cranial, caudal, is I've colored them. Cranial is in purple, caudal's in blue. And that's to indis uh, indicate to you that the purple's on top, blue's at the bottom. And at the sixth week, it actually comes out of the embryo. The reason why it comes out of the embryo is because the abdominal cavity is too small. We've got a big liver proportional to the cavity and the midgut just can't develop in there. So the actual intestines come out of the whole body and it comes through. And this is what this is indicating here. This is the body wall here, like so, like so. And this would be the umbilical cord at century, essentially. So that's going to be the vitelline duct, which is here. So the vitelline duct is coming out to you. And that's the primary loops. Cranial, caudal, purple, blue. So that's the herniation. And that's one of the learning outcomes. It actually has to herniate. It comes out at the sixth week, and hopefully it's all the way back in by the 10th week. Now the first thing, so now we're gonna go through the rotations. So if you are looking straight ahead, this is the cranial loop, this is the caudal loop. So this is in purple, this is in blue. This is on top, this is below. Now, all the rotations together is a 270 degree counterclockwise rotation, all together. But the first 90 degrees happens outside the body, the latter 280 happens back in the body. So we'll start with the 90. The first thing that happens, cranial, purple, blue, caudal. We rotate, looking towards me, actually on the superior mesenteric artery plane, it rotates 90 degrees like so. So now the purple's on the right, the blue's on the left. Now as this is developing, the cranial loop is actually lengthening a lot more than the caudal loop. So it's starting to fold on itself which you can see happening here like so. So that's actually getting quite longer compared to the caudal loop, which is still lengthening, but in comparison to that, it's a lot less. Um, now, it's, good, it's important to remember that this junction here, right here, is the junction between the foregut and the, so I'll do this in the red, the foregut and the start of the midgut. So that's gonna be where the liver bud came out or where you have the, um, the bile duct coming into the duodenum. So that's kind of the midway of the duodenum here. Now, as you know with the duodenum, the first part is intraperitoneal, second and third part is retroperitoneal, and the fourth part comes back to intraperitoneal. So the third part's probably considered midgut, which is going to be important for blood supply. And then the fourth part is definitely midgut, and that's going to pop back out. And that's kind of probably called the duodenal cap. Now, that, the part or the, the dorsal mesentery, which is that part there, that's important for that turning is what we call the ligamental of traits, or sometimes they call it the, uh, the sp suspensory ligament of the duodenum or suspensory muscle of the duodenum. Now, that's important because that forms the rotation of what we're seeing there. It helps to rotate, but it also helps. This is the muscle. It also helps. It will be joining kind of here. It helps to pull back and kind of widen 
the dejuno, jejunal flexure. So it actually helps to open it up. And that's the ligamental traits. That's the common um, term for it. It becomes also important because sometimes at that point, if you have bleeding in, into the gut, blood into the gut from the ligamental traits distally will cause um, digested blood, which is melena, whereas um, blood proximal to it will probably result in vomiting blood and um, more frank blood. But it's just, that's just a side point. So at this point, this is where that ligament would be, kind of around there, and that's allowing the axis of that turn to occur. So that would be in here on the abdominal wall. So this first part right here would be the duodenum. This part is going to be all the jejunum, and then we've kind of got the looping into the ilium, okay? My kind of uh, wrist here is going to be the, the developing cecum, and then the ascending colon transverse. So we've done a 90 degrees turn, which is indicated here. Now at the 10th week, which is this image, we're coming back into the embryo. So we're bringing all the intestinal loops back in. Now, as I said, we've had a lot more development, a lot more lengthening at the cranial loop, which is now here. So it's a lot bigger compared to this. So as it's pulling back in, most of the cranial loop or the purple part is coming across, more across to the left hand side. So it gets pulled to the, this left side of the abdomen, whilst the, the caudal loop is going more to the right. And so this is the next turn. So we've gone 90 degrees to begin with. We've done another 90 degrees counterclockwise. So there's my cecum as we're coming in. So now the cecum sits up on the, the right, up at the right quadrant. And so that's sitting up near the right lobe of the liver. And so you can see the continuation here across and then even the last part going down a bit further. The last part of the ilium you can see kind of still trailing behind on the midsection and all the purple, which is the cranial loop, has gone much deeper. We start to see uh, on the caudal loop, we start to see the appendix starting to form, but the cecum sits much higher up here like so. Now the last thing, is, the last thing to happen is the last 90 degrees of rotation. So the cecum's here, so it's got to go down to here. So another 90 degrees counterclockwise. So it's going down like so. And so the rotations, I'll just draw it. We've got a rotation 90 degrees like so. So we've done 90 degrees turning. And then we've done another 90 degrees counterclockwise like so. And then we've done another 90 degrees like so. And so 270 degrees of rotation, which has resulted in the caudal loop now framing the outside. So the cecum is sitting down in the right iliac fossa with probably, as it's descending down, the appendix is developing. So the appendix is probably going to be retrocecal or posterior. We've got a bit of ilium, which is from that cranial loop, caudal loop, should I say. So not much left. And we've got all the ascending colon and we've re resulted with the mid-gut ending at two-thirds of the way across to the transverse colon. So that's where the mid-gut now ends, two-thirds distally of the transverse colon. So in the green, you can see all the hind gut. In the red, you can see all the foregut. And the purple in behind is, is that cranial intestinal loop. So that's really left, that's really the end of the lecture. So we've seen that we've herniated at about the sixth week. We've seen the three different types of ro rotations, which has resulted in the, the way that the adult structures are now sitting. The, some of the clinical correlates just to be aware of is probably around the way that it herniates. So when it comes out at the sixth week, if when it comes out of the umbilicus, if that doesn't result in coming back in, what we can see is a lot of intestines with the amnion can stay outside the embryo. So it doesn't come in at the 10th week. And that leads to a what we call a omphalocele, which is kind of a big lot of intestines and, and some accessory organs like liver, spleen, can result in this big 
kind of um, dilated sac, which is called an omphalocele, and that results staying out. Now, this is probably due to other chromosomal defects, so this can have a, a, a higher mortality rate. Another kind of similarity is a gastroschisis, which is kind of more a failure of the abdominal wall to close. So rather than it getting stuck out, it, the abdominal wall kind of fails to close and some of the intestines will be, also be out, but it won't be wrapped in the amnion like the omphalocele. Now because the, the gastroschisis doesn't have uh, associated with a chromosomal defect as much, it seems to be associated more with, with younger mothers and that because it's not associated with a chromosomal defect, it has a less or a lower mortality rate compared to the omphalocele. Now, another one is the way that the vitiline duct kind of closes. Sometimes it remains patent and you can get a fistula between kind of the ileum or the last part of the ileum and that duct which kind of goes out to the abdominal anterior abdominal wall. So that can be a fistula or it, or it can remain with a kind of a ligament which can cause a twisting or a volvulus around that and that's called uh, a Meckel's diverticula. And now if that remains in place, which can be relatively common, if the gut rotates it around it can twist and cause ischemia and a volvulus. The last thing I just want to mention is the blood supply. So we can see here the way that the branches are. So from the superior mesenteric artery, the first branch that kind of supplies the duodenum is going to be the inferior pancreatic duodenum. So that suggests it's going to supply some of the pancreas and the latter part of the duodenum. Then we go into the ileal branches and then the jejunal branches, ileocecal branches, the right colic branches, and then the middle colic branches. And once you've done all your rotations, that's going to end up with the, Ill, the inferior pancreatic duodenal supplying more that region, the ileo supplying this part, the jejunal this part, ileocecal this part, the right colic this part, and the middle colic this part. And that's essentially all the midgut supplied with the superior mesenteric artery. So hopefully that's has helped. You, hopefully now you know where the midgut starts, where it finishes, not only in the embryo but with the adult. You know the arterial supply and all the different parts that it supplies in the adult. You know how the embryo or the, sorry, how the midgut rotated in a total of 270 degrees counterclockwise and you know when it herniated and when it went back in. The next lecture will go into the hindgut.